right, so I'll step on the cables. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, very honored to be here. Thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is my first systems meeting, so I'm very uh, excited and only a little intimidated. Um, so I'm here to talk about some uh, work I did as part of my PhD project at UT Austin um, using some reduced complexity modeling to understand material transport in river deltas. So I want to thank my co-authors here, uh, as well as um, some collaborators at Caltech, uh, as well as um, UT and JPL for, for funding this work. Um, and with that, I'll get into uh, the presentation. So um, we're going to be talking about river deltas, which are these very interesting and dynamic landscapes that I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. Um, and one of the central features of deltas that I want to underscore is that the way that these systems build land and function depends on how flows of water sediment and other materials get distributed and partitioned around these landscapes um, and between channels and wetlands. So in general, uh, water is the driving force for the transport of these materials, obviously, um, which gets at this idea of hydrological connectivity uh, being a very important feature of these landscapes. So delivering these materials into, into uh, the wetlands and, and uh, places where these materials are depositing and building these systems. Um, and thanks to, uh, you know, advancements in tools like hydrodynamic models and, and uh, you know, advanced field methods like ADCPs, uh, our ability to constrain water transport and connectivity in, in deltas continues to improve, um, especially in this wax lake system down here on the bottom right, which I'll be talking about a lot today. Um, but I want to uh, talk about something a little different than water, um, because I think that uh, even though we're understanding the water transport a little better, I think there's uh, some interesting dynamics that could be happening with other materials that we're maybe not capturing with these, with these water dynamics. Um, so the, the main thing that I want to talk about today is that unlike water, um, most of these other things that are transporting into deltas that we're interested in um, have some positive or negative buoyancy in, in water and tend to concentrate either near the surface or near the bed. Um, so due to this balance of sort of turbulent mixing and settling, uh, you end up with these um, vertically stratified concentration profiles that leads to, you know, this non-uniform uh, shape that you see here. So this is, uh, you know, something that's typical of sediment where you have most of the sediment concentrated near the bed. Um, and this is true of other materials too. So we could think about, for example, plastics or microplastics that might be buoyant, might be uh, negatively buoyant. Um, and so they could concentrate near the surface or sort of somewhere in between. Um, and so the question I wanna ask with this presentation is how does particle buoyancy affect the patterns of transport that we see uh, especially in these deltaic systems. And one big reason that I think that this matters, uh, I'm going to demonstrate with this sort of simplified schematic. Um, and so you can imagine that if we're looking at something flowing downstream in a river delta where there's kind of a central channel and then there's some amount of exchange into these nearby wetlands where, where water's flowing over these uh, sort of intertidal levees, um, if we imagine that there's sort of three different distinct populations of materials that are concentrated in different locations of the, of the water uh, profile, some near the surface, some near the bed, and perhaps something in between. Um, you can imagine that if something is sort of floating on the surface, that these uh, populations are gonna find it much easier to spill over uh, into these nearby uh, uh, intertidal wetlands or, or islands, um, because it's, it's much easier to overtop these sort of topographic features in the landscape. Meanwhile, things that are sort of uh, you know heavy in the water column and, and are not only flowing downstream, but also sort of you know, uh, pulled more so by gravity. They're also sliding downhill. And so you're gonna find higher concentrations sort of near the, the thaw wag of these channels. Um, and so just due to this sort of differential topographic steering that you would expect based on these things being in different locations, um, we think that this could affect the, the transport pathways of these different materials. And that's what we sort of want to investigate today. Um, but this is a little difficult to model in a generalized way. So we have models for most of these, you know, things that we're interested in in, in these landscapes. Um, and we could we could be talking about a, a wide variety of things that could be interesting in depositional landscapes like a delta. We could talk about surfactants, so mineral or biogenic oils, um, many biotic elements like floating vegetation, fish larvae, seeds, things that are often floating. Uh, perhaps we're interested in ice or or woods. Uh, or plastics, which uh, wood and plastics could be heavy or they could be floating. It depends on the, you know, attributes of that material, uh, as well as, you know, a variety of sediments that could be uh, sort of well mixed into the water or, or sinking at the, at the bottom. Um, and we have a lot of models for, for different components of this, uh, you know, state space. Um, but due to a bunch of model differences, it becomes a little hard to compare those transport patterns in a generalized way between different models because there's a lot of 
model assumptions that are built in that make it difficult to uh, compare things to each other. So we are actually going to take some inspiration from a reduced complexity model that many of you will be familiar with called Delta RCM. Um, this is a morphodynamic model that is able to build these rare, very realistic um, deltaic systems just through uh, a simple uh, uh, few parameters that um, just by changing a single parameter, uh, you can change the way water, mud, or, or sand are routed in these systems. Um, and so we're going to take inspiration from this, and we're going to build this out into this um, uh, Python package called Dorado that we may, me and my co-authors helped develop, um, which is a uh, Python package for simulating passive particle transport in shallow water flows. So basically, this model is a stochastic reduced complexity Lagrangian model. It's, it's for uh, particle transport, and it uses the same uh, transport rules as Delta RCM. Um, it's a stochastic model, it's a Markovian model, and it's kind of an agent-based approach. Um, and the way that this model works is that just by changing a few routing parameters, gamma and theta, um, and theta is going to be of interest in, in this presentation, um, we can change the, the uh, extent of this topographic steering effect that I, that I described uh, before. Um, and this is a grid-based model, so these, these particles are basically walking downstream in a D8 fashion. And the, the routing weights to each of the cells that it uh, can be routed to depend on, uh, first, the, the hydrodynamic information that you're pulling from some you know, more sophisticated or higher fidelity model, like a hydrodynamic model. Um, and then there's a stochastic element that uh, chooses the, the weights of the cells according to a couple different different features. And I'm going to talk a bit about theta because that's the one of interest today. Um, and the way theta works is that when a particle is stepping into a downstream cell, uh, you can imagine that if we have a theta of zero, then the, the routing weights are not affected by the depth of these receiving cells. So any uh, cell that is sort of in the downstream vector is equally likely. Whereas if you have a, a theta of, for example, one, then um, this uh, routing weight is linearly proportional to depth. So we uh, are routing sort of in proportion to how much room there is in those cells, which is a more applicable assumption for something like water. Um, whereas if we have an even higher theta, such as a theta of two, then this uh, dependence on depth is nonlinear. So it, it's not only routing downstream in proportion to depth, but also potentially sliding downhill or, or adding in this extra uh, element that you would expect for something more like sediment. And that's the way that Delta RCM uses this parameter is that water is routed with a theta of one and uh, sediments are routed with a higher theta. So just by changing this simple parameter, we can actually uh, extend this to a, a pretty wide range of different materials that we might be interested in. And that's what we tried to do with our work uh, for this. So we're focusing again on the Wax Lake and Atchafalaya Delta system in, in coastal Louisiana. So this is a smaller distributary of the Mississippi River. Um, and we built out this uh, sort of suite of simulations that varied a few things that we wanted to, to investigate. Um, two of these things are environmental conditions. So by changing the discharge between low and high and changing the tides between kind of a steady scenario and an unsteady scenario, we can see how these transport patterns are changing for, for some different uh, environmental conditions. And then we tried a sort of range of uh, sort of pseudo materials that we're interested in by changing this theta parameter between uh, a range of zero and one. And the idea is that hypothetically speaking, uh, we should be able to approximate the transport pathways of a bunch of different kinds of things just by changing this, this simple parameter. Obviously, this is very simplified physics, so we're not you know, using the most you know, sophisticated high, high physics model, um, but we can compare these things directly to each other by uh, using this approach because we're, we're simply changing you know, one consistent thing between all of them, so the model is staying the same. Uh, and the metrics that we're going to be using to compare this transport, um, one of the specific frameworks that I, I want to uh, specifically touch on is this idea of a nourishment area. So this is a sort of downstream equivalent of uh, the catchment area that you might be more familiar with in more upstream uh, hydrological application. And the idea is that in a delta system, the nourishment area is the region of space that's nourished by material from some given location. Um, and so we're, we're specifically looking at uh, sort of a global picture of nourishment in these deltas. So just from, from the apex, we're seeding these materials uh, and we're watching how they propagate. And over the entire time span of our simulation and over all of the particles that we're seeding, we uh, basically for every location in our delta, we're seeing how many times uh, that location was visited by some, some material. And we're quantifying that over the whole range of our simulation. 
and then normalizing it into uh, zero to one. So basically we end up with this picture that um, shows in, in the darker colors places that received a significant amount of material from that injection site. Uh, and then for it kind of fades sort of into this background gray in places that were rarely, if ever, visited um, by, these, by these particles. Uh, and what's cool about this is that for each simulation that we do, we can compute this nourishment area uh, again and again for every, you know, uh, environmental condition that we're looking at and every, you know, pseudo material with this theta parameter. So here I'm showing six examples. Um, and you can see just kind of looking at these in a qualitative sense, that this picture is changing. So there are some very interesting trends that you can kind of visualize and see by simply changing, changing uh, one or more of these, uh, you know, different variables that we're looking at. Um, or we can perhaps, you know, change scenarios again and, and look at how this picture is changing between these. Um, but the, the interesting thing that I want to really touch on is that because this is a quantitative approach uh, that uh, actually quantifies this magnitude of nourishment in each of these scenarios, we can directly stack these on top of each other and, and take differences to see which regions are, relatively speaking, receiving more material in different cir circumstances. Um, and so here's a particular example of that where we're looking at how the nourishment uh, is changing by uh, a function of discharge. So if we change the discharge from low to high um, for these particular, uh, you know, three, you know, pseudo materials with this, this theta parameter, um, we're seeing how these nourishment patterns changed in each of these, these scenarios. So places that are shown in blue are places that were receiving a greater relative nourishment when the discharge was high, uh, whereas uh, places that are shown in red were receiving a greater relative nourishment at a low discharge. Um, and if you're familiar with deltas, you, you would not be surprised to see that we're seeing blue inside of these interdistributary islands. So islands receive more flow when it's flooding. That, you know, intuitively makes sense. Um, and you can you look at the same picture as a function of tides. So if we turn on and off tides, we can look at the same difference map. So again, tides, um, when we, you know, increase this, this mixing in the system, we're seeing more material flushed back into these islands. So we're getting more of this exchange with these uh, you know, wet, wetlands that we're very interested in. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting things to pull out of this, this picture, um, but one specific one that I wanted to point out is that uh, you can see that as we move from left to right on this, on this slide, we're generally seeing less colors. Um, and that's uh, one interesting finding that we found is that um, it appears that patterns of buoyant material transport seem to be much more sensitive to these environmental changes than at higher thetas. So I thought that was a, an interesting finding. It's maybe not super surprising, but it's um, very, very interesting to be able to quantify that. We can also look uh, for some given uh, environmental condition. If we change this, this theta parameter, um, how that nourishment changes relative to what we would expect for water. Um, and so each of these four maps that I'm showing here are taking the difference between the nourishment of water and the nourishment of this other material that we're looking at. So places that are shown in brown are places where we're seeing sort of a relative enrichment of that material. You can think of this sort of like a concentration. Um, so places that are brown are higher concentration of those materials relative to what's entering the delta upstream. Um, and places that are blue are places with lower concentration. So you can see uh, sort of where we expect more of these materials uh, in, in these, these deltas. So one last way that I wanted to quantify these differences is I mentioned that in the Wax Lake, we're very interested in this idea of hydrological connectivity between the channels and the islands. Uh, and so I basically constructed uh, sort of a pseudo ADCP um, water budget approach where I drew these radial transects at different distances downstream from the apex. And I wanted to see just in, in bulk what amount of material is exiting out of the channels versus out of the islands in the Wax Lake. Um, and so I'll start with Actually, I'll go ahead to this one. So for some particular uh, you know, environmental conditions, if we look at the total amount of water that is exiting out of the islands versus out of the channels, um, focusing on these downstream plots that are showing this downstream transect, um, we see that the total flux of water that's exiting the delta through islands rather than out of channels is about 25 to 40%, which is a very typical number based on the field estimates that have been done in the Wax Lake. So how does this number change if we change theta if we look at a different material. Um, so here we're looking at sort of floating materials, things that tend to be more concentrated near the surface. And we can see that this number actually increases to 60 to 65%. So significantly more material is exiting out of the islands than out of the channels. It's actually 
preferentially uh, uh, much harder to stay in the channel the entire way uh, down, down the uh, transported downstream. Meanwhile, if we look at something that's uh, you know, sinking, something more like sediment, um, we're seeing a much lower fraction of material uh, exiting out of the islands down to 10 to 15%. And that's not to say this 10 to 15% is not a relatively speaking, you know, large flux of, of material. Like obviously these islands are being built from the sediment that's making it into them. Um, but compared to the amount of water that's entering them, it's a very different magnitude, um, which I think is, is interesting uh, from the perspective of using water as a proxy for where these other things are going. Um, I'm not gonna belabor the point of this too much uh, in uh, pursuit of time, but, we uh, wanted to get a little more specific. I've been talking this whole time about this theta parameter, which is uh, sort of a model specific abstract concept of what kind of material we might be looking at. Um, and so I wanted to tie this back into a, you know, a more like um, physical parameter that you could use to, to say where you are in the state space instead of just a theta of one or two or whatever. Uh, what are we actually talking about when we're looking at each of these maps? So I constructed this little toy model uh, where we imagine some material is routing from, from cell A into either cell or B, cell B or C, depending on you know, some, some uh, uh, preference based on the changing topography in each of these cells. Um, and if we imagine that we have some concentration profile um, and we fill in some, some other details about the simplified model, we can sort of derive what uh, flux of material we might expect into each of these uh, downstream cells. Um, and going back to the definition that we used in the routing weights in, in Dorado, we can sort of tie these sediment fluxes uh, into what these you know, different routing weights are in, in the model based on the uh, theta parameter that we've been using. And uh, if that was way too fast and not easy to follow, the, the, the point of this is that we were able to derive essentially this plot that I'm showing here on the left, which uh, is now uh, showing what the uh, theta parameter looks like for a range of different uh, Rouse numbers or, or suspension numbers, um, including the sort of negatively buoyant, uh, you know, sinking materials, as well as the positively buoyant floating materials all in one, one, one plot. Uh, and what's cool about this is that we can go to, to field data and we can look and see what kinds of materials tend to occupy different parts of this, this plot. Uh, and so we can fill in some details and say, okay, um, you know, the, this, you know, particular theta is a, a appropriate for flocculated mud, and this one is for sand, and yeah, certain plastics tend to follow, uh, fall in this, you know, surface load range, and so you can actually work backwards from this and say, uh, you know, if I have some material that I'm interested in in these, these fluvial systems, um, you can use this to say what, what theta should I be using if I wanted to approximate these, these transport patterns. Um, and so I'll get into a few conclusions and uh, to, to drive home those conclusions, I wanted to show one last figure. Um, and what I'm showing here is the choice of theta that led to the maximal nourishment in each location in the system. So places that are blue are places that were maximally nourished by a uh, sort of floating material, whereas the yellow colors are places that are maximally nourished by a sinking material. Uh, and what I think is interesting is that um, going back to the very you know, definition of how the model is implementing these routing weights, this is a local parameter. It's, it's locally changing the preference for, for routing into each of these downstream cells. Um, and just using this local vertical stratification combined with this sort of differential topographic steering, we see uh, that this is sufficient to create these emergent system scale uh, sort of hydraulic sorting of materials in space. So looking at this, this, this delta on the right, we're not modeling deposition, this is a passive model, but you can imagine that if we were modeling deposition that we would be seeing very different deposits in, in these different types of things that are routing in the system, um, which is interesting that these, are, these systems are being built by these materials that are routing you know, through them. And that, that uh, paints a very interesting picture, I think, of um, how these are getting sorted. Um, likewise, we saw that these external drivers like discharge and sediment, as, or discharge and tides, um, as well as some other parameters that, uh, like wind and waves, um, did not affect all of these nourishment patterns equally. Floating materials were more affected by these changes in environmental conditions than other, uh, other uh, materials were. And so these external flows of energy into the delta uh, seem to be able to reinforce these spatial gradients between these sort of geomorphic constituents. So, um, you know, floating, floating vegetation and seeds are being routed to somewhere different than, than uh, a lot of sediment. And I think that has 
interesting uh, eco-geomorphic implications. Um, I wanted to emphasize that Dorado is fully open source. Uh, it's compatible with any you know, 2D hydrodynamic flow fields that you might have access to. So um, if this is something you're interested in using in your landscape, it should be pretty easy to copy and paste this entire approach to, to whatever system or, or model you, you happen to be using. Um, and I, I really like that it's able to quantitatively compare this partitioning and uh, connectivity between materials in a unified way. Obviously, this is a very simplified approach, so we're leaving out a lot of interesting physics for each individual material. Um, but the weakness of that is also a strength because we know that we're comparing things like to like, um, which I think is a very fun and, and uh, interesting approach. So with that, I will uh, uh, call it. That is, that's all. Questions for Carl? Or uh, hold on for the microphone. Really great presentation, Kyle. I appreciated it. Um, my question is, is, is there a pathway to linking this model with morphodynamic models, like to translating this, this information into morphodynamics? Absolutely. Uh, that's a, thank you. And that's a very good question. I, I think that there is. And I think it's one of the more interesting things that I, I would like to see, you know, worked on is adding in that depositional component. And um, uh, I, I know that I'm talking mostly about the sorting that you see when you simply have just a passive particle that has this, you know, differential sorting uh, effect that I'm showing here. Um, but when you add in the depositional picture and potentially materials that transport at a different speed than water, um, there's a there's a whole other realm of of uh, processes that could be influencing where things are ending up in space, and I I think that would be a very interesting you know second layer on top of this. Now that we understand this a little bit better, I think um, you know we can build up more and more sorting processes from there. One other question from Chris. So that was super cool talk. I, I really like, and I like the way you were quantifying the, the value of theta depending on the Brouse equation, that kind of thing. But one component of that is that that will change with the local shear velocity, right? So can your model change theta on the fly place by place as things are going on? Right, so it cannot, and that is definitely a weakness. So uh, going back to this plot that I showed here, um, the fact that these aren't just one line, but actually a couple different lines is, um, this spread is due to the weakness of that assumption being sort of a global, yeah, you know, single parameter in space. So we're we're making the assumption that that doesn't change too much in space, which, um, you know, based on the spread of these these uh, you know plots from each other, is not you know a considerable amount of variability given the other modeling assumptions we're making. So it doesn't seem like it's maybe the biggest source of uncertainty, but yeah, it isn't actually a a perfectly global parameter. So that that is true. 